Okay, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get going. People are still sort of filtering in from lunch, but that's cool. So welcome, good afternoon. I uh, hope you all had a good lunch. Um, I'm Chris Wilson, this is my colleague Dan Lee, and we're here to talk with you about building web apps for Google TV. And um, if you wanna tweet about this, this presentation, this session, our, um, our hashtag is on every slide, so handy reference, you don't need to remember it up front, it's GTV web. I'm gonna resist the temptation to actually watch Twitter while I'm talking, but um, you can queue up questions for the end. So before we really get going, I wanna cover why television is even interesting, like why we should care about television. It's kinda of old media. Probably a lot of you in this room um, may not even have a TV. I know a number of friends who don't have a TV anymore. But, you know, we do have the web, but the interesting fact is that TV is actually really, really popular. Um, more American households have TVs than cell phones or computers. Computers, there are about 80% of American households have computers, and uh, about 90% of American households have cell phones, some form of mobile device, and 99% of American households have at least one TV. In fact, more than, uh, more than half of those households have three or more TVs. It's a whole lot of surface area, and a whole, lot of, uh, a whole lot of screens for applications to be on. Worldwide, of course, numbers are a little bit different, but worldwide, three quarters of all households have TVs in them. So even you know, third world nations and everything, three quarters of everyone has a TV in their home. In addition to that, you know, that that's kind of all TVs, right? That's every kind of old NTSC TV, PAL TV, whatever. What we're really talking about here, of course, is internet-capable or smart TVs. And there are not, relatively speaking, tons of these out there today. There are about two million in the US um, as of last year. But by 2014, it's expected that more than a third of all US households will have a, an internet-connected TV in it, uh, 43 million. So you can see the growth curve on this has to be pretty astronomical to get up that high. In addition to that, TV is actually used more than any other media. Um, in fact, in today, uh, Americans spend more time watching TV than computer use and listening to music put together. And this is among eight to 18 year olds, right? This is among young kids, teenagers. The ones you would expect would actually not be so focused on TV and would be more focused on listening to music or using the computer to chat with their friends or whatever. They're actually still watching TV more than both of those put together. In fact, they, use, they watch TV more than three times as much as they use a computer. So, to sum up, TVs are more common than computers. Americans actually spend more time watching TV than any other activity. So, we kind of ought to make better use of this time. Now, that sounds like I'm saying stop watching TV. Um, that's not actually my point, obviously. What I'm really saying is there's a lot of opportunities to make that TV experience better, and that's really what we want to talk about today. And that's really what sparked the Google TV project, in fact. The ideas behind Google TV were really pretty simple. First of all, we can take live TV, the, the regular TV experience, and make it a lot better. We can apply search to it, since obviously Google knows a little bit about search. We can give live info on what's on so that we can help you find stuff that you want to watch rather than you having to sit there with your cable remote flipping through 500 channels hoping to find something interesting. Secondly, there's a lot of great web content out there already on the web. And it's kind of silly to watch all of these videos and, and other content in a little six inch window on your 13 inch laptop when you've got the biggest screen in the house probably staring at you in your living room and you probably have the best sound system in your house attached to it as well. Uh, statistically speaking, that's usually true. You have the best speaker system attached to your TV system. Now, there are two billion videos watched every day on YouTube alone. Um, there are 35 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. So this actually outstrips what you can watch live by about 2,100 times. So um, they can't all be funny cat videos. There should be enough to keep you busy. So there's tons of great web content. We want to get that on TV. And the final idea behind Google TV, and this is really what we're here to talk about, is smart TV obviously needs a platform for interactive applications. Manufacturers were already starting to kind of roll their own vertical platforms for smart TV. 
And we kind of said, hey, we already have a, a platform. We have two platforms, actually, Android and the web platform. Both of those make a great platform for interactive TV apps. With an interactive platform, when you start thinking about all the time that you spend parked in front of your TV, there are some really specific opportunities that come to mind. And we want to mention a few of these particular areas that were compelling up front. First, any media consumption activity that might have a social aspect can be really compelling on TV. So if you want to watch the game together with your friends, but you don't actually want them in your living room eating your nachos, drinking your beer, um, you can do that if you have an interactive platform that can consume media and connect to the internet at the same time. There's also a big opportunity for applications that span across devices or environments. The, the example that I usually use here is you can build an application centered around food. And you can sit on your couch and watch episodes of your favorite cooking show. And then when you see something that looks really tasty, you want to make it for dinner, you head to the store and you pull out your mobile device. And the application now running on your mobile device already knows what you are looking at and it gives you a shopping list. In fact, it might even guide you based on your location to what stores you need to go to to get the right ingredients. And then finally, you go back to your kitchen, you go to make the recipe, and with your laptop or your tablet or another TV bolted to your wall or whatever, you get the actual recipe steps and maybe videos on how to properly caramelize onions or something like that. Next, casual games are another really interesting area for TV. I say casual games, and I mention games here because obviously games on TV have a very long history. Yes, I had an Atari 2600 at one point. Um, I don't say games across the board here because I think that casual games are an opportunity. They really haven't been nailed on TV yet. Console games actually very, very healthy, uh, healthy ecosystem right now. It's more, I think there's a lot of opportunity to build more casual games and get them on the TV space when you sit down and you want to kill a few, few minutes playing something. Which brings me to the last opportunity. And this is the opportunity to make connected applications that pair or work across devices. And this is really because I don't think I've actually sat down to watch TV any time in the last three or four years without having my mobile device or a tablet on me at the same time, like I'll check IMDb or something like that. And we have built a, a Google TV remote control application for iOS and Android, so you can effectively replace your remote control with your mobile device. So you pull it out, you can flip channels, change the volume, whatever, do searches, uh, drive the, the pointer device. But that's not really the key thing that I'm getting at here. What we really want uh, people to focus on is building applications that connect mobile devices and tablets or any other device together to drive the experience on the big screen. You already have in your hand or your purse or, uh, or your pocket um, a device that has a ton of controllers on it, a ton of sensors. You, know, you have audio input, you have an accelerometer and a gyroscope, audio uh, and a touchscreen display. You, um, we want to connect that to the TV. We shouldn't need to give you yet another remote control to lose. You're already carrying one. So I think we want to uh, give a, a very quick demo of a couple of applications that show this sort of thing. And the first one is interesting. Seems to have hey, lost me. I don't have all day here, people. Let's play. <laughs> well, let's see. So we're both trying to join this. I'm, I'm joining it you from an iPhone. Two people to play Dan is trying to join it from. OK, why don't you? Uh... Want to start? My iOS device is actually unconnected. Everybody ready? Let's do this. OK. Connecting. Hey, well there we go. Start. So this application, um, one of us, and I'm not sure who it is yet, gets to draw. And this is essentially like Pictionary. Ready. Alan Queen, right on. From the audience, even. So Alan gets a word on his mobile device, and it says, you should draw something. And I'm going to guess that looks like a snake. Oh, player four makes short work of all right. Andre guessed River, but I, I beat him to it. 
So you can see all of us are participating in this, in this experience right now from our own personal devices. There are lots of other ideas for applications that you may want to, um, to implement that work like this. Uh, this is a, a Movil application. They're actually in the sandbox today, so they're showing off some of their other applications as well. Let me go ahead and close that. There are a lot of other applications that really that don't yet make use of the, the sort of paired controller idea, but, um, but give you a lot of it's kind of a social aspect in the living room. And one of those that we wanted to show really quickly was another HTML-based demo called the Karaoke Channel. And Dan's going to sing for you here. All right. I personally think we should open up to a vote as to what he sings, but um, I think he had a, a request. And, oh, wait, there it was. So this is actually a relatively simple application, um, but it's very compelling on your big screen. And I'm going to go ahead and pop it full screen so you get a more TV-like experience. <laughs> They're all saying Mike, Dan. <laughs> so really the key point we're trying to get here is that there are some very engaging applications. And having it on a big screen, and obviously this might be a little bit bigger than your TV, is a really good idea. It's, it's a really good way to engage multiple people. Now, as I mentioned before, Google TV and Android. Google TV is based on Android. It's, it's an Android device. And we will be unlocking the ability to, uh, for consumers to install Android applications very soon. Christian and Jason have a session about that side, um, actually the next session round this afternoon, uh, up in building 11, or building 11, room 11. But here, we're talking about the web platform. Now, Google TV's web platform is Chrome. It has a special TV UI applied to it, so you get a, uh, an address bar that doesn't always sit there and take up space. And you have a very TV-centric, designed to be driven from a directional pad navigation system. But this means we have a modern browser. We have HTML5. We have, we're built on top of WebKit. We also have Adobe Flash implemented on Google TV. We have H.264 video natively implemented as well. So any, any content that needs that is, is going to be there on TV. And finally, I want to mention, we update automatically over the network. So the web platform gets better over time. You don't have to do anything. Um, mine at home has updated multiple times already. So Now, I basically just said we support the web platform. If you're already a web developer, I kind of said the magic words. I said WebKit and web platform. So what more do you need to know? Like, you can all leave. Um, we're only 15 minutes in or something. But it turns out TV is a little bit of a different space. It's a different mental space. Users tend to be in what we sometimes call couch mode or lean back mode. They're in this very passive interaction mode. They don't really want to lean forward and uh, sit there with a the keyboard and a mouse and drive it. Um, in fact, I was sitting there watching TV with my wife, and a commercial for interactive TV came on one time. And my wife actually said, but I don't want to be interactive. I just want to watch TV. And I tried to explain what I did again, and she kind of <laughs> got a little confused. But the idea is you really needed to, to build a UI, to build an application that is in that kind of space, right? That you provide a, a UI that you're comfortable driving, kicking back on your couch from 10 feet away. So I want to give, well, that's a weird. So I want to give a couple of examples of websites that have already gone and done this work that have built a 10-foot um, a UI of some, some form or another and call out a few things about them. So this is Vimeo. Um, I'm actually using Vimeo as an example here because I use YouTube later. So um, Vimeo is a, a video content website. And this is what I get. I'm already logged in as me. Whoops. This is what I get if I don't lock my screen. Um, it's got a ton of stuff on it. And the text is really small, and it's hard for me to read, and it's hard for me to actually find what it is that I'm, I want to watch. 
Like maybe I want to hear some more about my camera or something. But it's not really, um, you know, I have to navigate this. You'll also notice there's a big scroll bar on the side. There's actually a couple pages worth of, of content just on this page alone. And I'm not even sure what the statistics thing is on this page. Now, Vimeo also has what they call couch mode. And couch mode is a little different because couch mode, when you go to couch mode, this is what you get. Video starts playing immediately and you can still navigate through all the content. You can find different things to, to watch. But this feels like TV, right? You turn it on and it just starts playing content. It's not like you have to go discover and lean in and figure out what you want to do next. It is kind of a passive experience. Similar to that, this is the Huffington Post news, uh, news site. And again, you'll notice there's a scroll bar, and this one's really impressive because this is many, 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 many pages of content. And down at the bottom, you have a huge, like the, the news sources menu is even bigger than will, will fit on my screen at a readable size. And the Huffington Post built an application called News Glide that gives a different kind of experience. And it's still a news site, and it's still kind of a, a static, uh, static way to look at the news. But at the same time, I can drive this completely with the arrow keys on my keyboard. I don't need to use a, I don't need to use a mouse to navigate. I, unfortunately, because this is running on the desktop browser, I'm getting a scroll bar. On TV, you don't, and it resizes properly. So you get a much better experience there. Now, the point we're trying to get, to get at with both of these, um, both of these quick demos are, go ahead and flip, uh, are, uh, there's different concepts you need to keep in mind. There, there's different ideas behind what you need to do to design for TV. And they fall into three basic categories. The first one is technical constraints. And these are things like resolution TV runs at and color issues and things like that. Then there are practical constraints, which is when you sit 10 feet away, things look smaller, big surprise, and what kind of input you typically have on your couch and that sort of thing. And then finally, we want to cover a few things that are design guidance. And these are a little bit more fuzzy. They're more, um, well, this is what makes a TV experience. And that doesn't mean you, can't, you absolutely can't violate these. It's whenever you do, the user is going to find that a little bit weird or a little bit different, I should say, from regular TV. So on the first one of these, on resolution, and this feels really weird, because I'm, I'm a longtime web platform guy, and you know, one of the hot things to discuss right now um, in the web design world is the concept of responsive design, building flexible designs that go across screen sizes and window sizes. TV has two resolutions, is the short version of this, 720p and 1080p, and you can design to those resolutions, and that's OK. Like, that's actually a, not a bad thing to do at all. Feels kind of weird, but there you have it. Except in old TV, prior to HDTV, prior to everyone having LCD flat panels, um, there was this concept called overscan. And if you've never heard of overscan before, overscan is basically on an old CRT-based display. The edges of the display were kind of rounded off. Um, some of the, the content might get cut off because of the rounded edges of the display, in the corners particularly, because TVs typically weren't exactly rectilinear. And finally, the bezel of the computer, like the plastic bit around the, the tube itself, could cut off some of the content too. So they had rules about where you were supposed to put content on one of these screens. They had the action safe area is basically the place where you're supposed to display anything that the user really does, or the consumer needs to see. So if you've got a character in a, a video moving, they probably want to stay within that action safe space. They might get cut off on some displays occasionally, but not a big deal. If you're putting titles or any textual information or anything like that up, you want to keep it between 5 and 10% away from the edges. And this is a fairly sizable chunk of, of screen real estate. And it's why, if you watch TV shows, um, particularly older TV shows, they don't put the titles or the characters or anything off at the corners, ever. That's why those little annoying channel pop-ups, they're not way off in the corner. They're actually, you know, they kind of uh, intrude into your space. And that's because they know they might get cut off otherwise. Now, technically, you would think 
LCDs and plasma displays wouldn't have this problem, right? You know exactly what resolution you're designing for. You should have every one of those pixels on your screen, right? And I actually thought this was true. And then I went and looked at the data, and it turns out that only about 40% of HDTVs sold today have all their pixels, like actually are designed for exactly 1080p or 720p. Um, up to about 30% of them drop 10 to 12% of their pixels, like literally just don't have them. So some displays are still gonna be missing the bits around the edge, and you need to be careful about having a somewhat flexible display. This means the edges of your screen may still get cut off. Don't build right up to the edges, is the short version. As well, you'll notice that um, this is essentially the same design. I just faked up one of them a little bit. You don't really want to build to the edges because on TV, it makes your screen look kind of uh, unbalanced. You really want to use some extra padding space, have some negative space between things because the user is sitting quite a ways away. They don't see things that are rammed right up next to each other very well. Now briefly, I want to talk about color. Um, the short version is the color gamut is different on TV than what you may be used to on a computer. NTSC gamut is still typically used for TV displays and it's both somewhat limited compared to sRGB or, or, um, or the Adobe gamut. Uh, but the real problem is that TVs are frequently not calibrated. In fact, I would flip that around and say TVs are almost never actually calibrated for color. So the worst part of this is that it's very easy to oversaturate, and in fact, people buy their TVs for that. Many TVs have a retail setting, it actually flips it into oversaturating and, and uh, cranking up the brightness and contrast as well. Because when somebody goes into Best Buy to buy a new TV, they typically look at all the TVs that are out there and they pick the one that's shiniest. Um, unfortunately, this is not the one that's most accurate or best at representing colors. It's just the one that's shiniest. So be careful about having very saturated colors in your web designs, uh, any of the design that goes on TV. Particularly oranges and reds tend to kind of blow out the, uh, blow out the saturation pretty quickly. Another interesting, uh, interesting thing that I didn't realize at first and then it started making sense is um, white is the default background of the web, right? If you just put doc type HTML and nothing else in a document and load it up, you get a white screen. That's typically not what you would expect on a TV. On a TV, you would expect it to be black. If you go to a channel that's not playing anything, they're usually showing a black screen or they're showing a test pattern. Now, this actually ends up translating to the consumer of if you look at something that is all white or heavily white on a TV, it feels like your TV is screaming at you. It's like all caps. It's really, really in your face and you don't generally want that. The other thing you have to be careful about is um, if you use pure white and pure black, you will get halo effects on some displays because they're not really designed to do a very fast transition back and forth between opposite ends of the spectrum. This, I think you can actually see it on the, the, the screen up here. Um, this is actually a photo I took of one of the TV screens sitting at my desk. And you can see it's got a weird little kind of halo effect around each letter. That's not a, you know, that's not a shadow effect or anything that actually is just showing up on the TV screen. And in fact, the other TV I have on my desk doesn't have it at all. So it's, it's definitely TV to TV. And that actually brings up to the last point of test your contrast on an actual TV display, not on a computer monitor, but on a TV. And in fact, not just one TV, it's best to test on a, several different TVs because you will get different frequency responses from them. On practical constraints, text is one of the areas where, um, you know, I can give you like very definitive guidance, like don't ever use six point font. Um, but really the idea is you wanna limit how much content you're trying to shove at the user, how much textual content you're shoving at the user on a TV display. You wanna limit the length of content chunks. Um, you know, more than a paragraph is probably more than they're gonna wanna read at once on TV. And make it as big as, you as you think it could possibly be needed. And then you might even want to make it a little bit bigger. Small text sizes, even the larger text size example here, is on the small side for TV content. It's just I was putting a lot of content in that design, so I needed it. Typical on-screen font guidance um, still applies. Sans serif fonts tend to be more readable. 
and don't use a ton of different fonts on a page because it's kind of jarring. On that vein, we do support font embedding on Google TV, which is, uh, which is handy for web designs. Scrolling. Uh, one of my favorite topics is scrolling because scrolling, you don't expect your TV to scroll. Um, you don't expect to have to scroll on your TV for a web application. Um, in newspapers, they have this concept called above the fold or below the fold. It's basically the fold in the newspaper. Whether you, when you have to flip it over, that's a, a big deal for, uh, for the user, so anything important goes on the first page. TV doesn't really have a below the fold because if, it, if it's off screen, I'm probably not ever gonna see it. I'm not gonna think to scroll down to it. So give visual cues to the user if there's more content and make it very deliberate if you're trying to, to make a multi-page or large canvas design. On that same vein, um, have a very strong focus model. So this is one that I also kind of screwed up on on a couple of the prototypes that I was building early on. You really want the user to be able to see where they are in your design and what they can do in your design. My, my example of how to mess this up is actually one that's currently shipping nearly everywhere, which is DVDs. I load a ton of DVDs. I have a six-year-old daughter. She watches lots of movies. She puts the DVD in, and you get to that page where it says, you know, like, play, scene selection, bonus features. And I keep having to, like, use the arrow keys to figure out where the cursor is because the, the coloring is so subtle between the selected and not selected. Um, I can't tell which one is selected. Don't do that. Like, make it really obvious this one is selected, like in this design. In that same vein, the user is typically going to use the directional pad for control. Um, they're already used to this kind of concept from their TV remote control, from their DVD or Blu-ray player, and, uh, and their gaming console controller, for that matter. So thankfully, this is really easy to support in the web platform. It's just key presses. It's arrow keys. In fact, you, you saw me use the arrow keys in NewsGlide a few minutes ago. This is kind of the same thing. Um, it's actually useful on desktop web as well. De uh, Google search results support this. The Amazon Window Shop app they released last fall uses arrow key navigation. And it actually kind of adds a lot to the experience if you can use arrow keys as well, particularly for those of us who like keyboard shortcuts. The problem with this is that the expected focus model for TV is two-dimensional. Like, you expect to be able to hit the down button and go down visually to the next focusable item. And the web platform has this linear model of tab and shift tab. And yes, I was around when we invented that, and it was a bad idea then. It's really a bad idea on the desktop web, too. You'd like to be able to navigate through links using the arrow keys, and there are add-ins to do that. But you do have to implement this part. We do have some tools for that. We'll talk about that a little later. And finally, um, one of my biggest pet peeves is the back key in web applications. When you're building a web application, if you don't think about what navigational model is in your user's mind, they're going to find it really disconcerting when they go several steps into your application and they've opened up what appears to be like windows inside your application or things like that. And they hit back and it takes them back to whatever website they were on before they were looking at your web application. It's pretty easy to fix this. You set the window location hash and respond to hash change events. Although I will caution, you don't want to do this for every possible state change. Like, that's, that's overkill. You just want to do it when it's a big thing, like opening up a window in, in your application. Now, I want to point out at this point, everything that I've said so far actually applies to just TV. It doesn't matter whether you're using a Google TV device or something else, you know. A uh, Mac Mini running a different browser attached to your TV. It's really more when you're displaying on a TV and you're using a remote control kind of interface. This is the one point in this presentation that is, that is Google TV specific. We auto-zoom web content, so when you go to a website, we're trying to make sure that we're using the maximum possible space. And um, if you want to shut that off in your, your web application, you can, or if you want to control it, you can do that through CSS as well. Now, on design guidance, so these are a little bit, like I said, they're a little bit squishier. They're not, you should do this, or this is how you do this, this piece. The first and foremost thing is 
make use of every bit of space you can on a TV display. Because you are sitting 10 feet back, you can't see things that are really small. Um, you'll notice this is YouTube on the left and YouTube lean back on the right. And the video is full screen in YouTube lean back. I actually captured the controls because I pulled them up on screen before I snapped the picture. So it has all the controls and it has a navigation system, but even that goes away when you're actually just, just watching the video. You wanna make the most use of all the space you have. And secondly, be sure to actually sit back and test your design on a TV or preferably multiple TVs. The reason why I say this is it's really not enough just to run it on a TV. I have a TV on my desk sitting right next to a, a computer monitor that's about the same size and they actually, like, my design's gonna look about the same on either one of those. The problem is when I go and put it on my other TV monitor, and, or my other TV, and I sit back 10 feet away, things look very different. You know, I can't read the text that I wrote, that I put up there in 10-point font. I might need to have it in 24-point font. So be sure to actually test it in a TV situation, not just on a TV when you're building TV designs. And this is a consistent thing. When you're thinking about the design of your application, don't think, well, I'm putting this on a 1080p display, so I've got you know, 1920 by 1080 pixels to work with, right? It's not quite the same as doing that on the desktop. Um, final bits of, of design guidance, kind of TV app guidance. On TV in particular, TV tends to be a very, very dynamic experience, mostly because the users of TV are very passive. The users of TV are kind of like you know, they're couch potatoes. They're not really paying, uh, they're not really driving all that much. You want to make sure to give them lots of visual feedback about what's going on so they don't think their computer or their, their TV experience has stalled out. Like if you flip to a TV channel and everything's static, you kind of say, well, hmm, TV, computer, or TV channel's computer must have crashed, I'll flip to another channel. You need to make sure not to let your users do that. So, Give visual feedback. If you're loading something, show a loading icon. If something's gonna take a few seconds, tell them that. You probably wanna give them directions, too, because this is kind of a new paradigm. Um, they don't know to hit down, and that's what brings up your toolbar or whatever. So make sure to give them a splash screen or steps to that, or make it so that your controls pop in very intuitively. You hit any key and they, they show up. And as I said, uh, experiences tend to not be static on TV. If you flip on the news um, and just watch the screen, not the person talking, but watch the screen, the elements on the screen, most of them have like dynamic backgrounds. They have subtle animations going on in the background or they have other things that are moving underneath them to hold the user's interest. You probably want to replicate that kind of effect. Use transitions to show, uh, to show motion between different states. And so now we've talked about kind of the, the general sets of guidance and the practical and, and technical constraints. We want to talk about the tools that we have to help people build um, TV-optimized experiences. The first one is, if you want to build a video content site, so you have a, a pool of video content and you want to get it up and make it optimized for TV, we have a set of TV UI templates to do this. These are implemented in both HTML and Flash. And there's two different templates. That's one on the left and one on the right. They're really just a different view of how you might want to present your content. Um, both of these are in HTML5 and Flash. Both of them support directional pad navigation and the video playback control, so like the play, pause, stop buttons. Um, and we have these site templates up on the on code site, so you can get them from there. There's a short link to them. And th but this is really only if you want to build a top-down design, and you can rebrand this, of course, that's the whole point, is you can put whatever branding you want in it, use some styling to, to change it, but functionally it'll still work the same way. If you want to do more than that, or you already have a site and you want to add some optimization for it, we have a set of, uh, a set of UI libraries that can help you do that. For this, I'm going to hand you over to Dan, and he can talk about what we have there. <coughs> Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, so uh, as Chris mentioned, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the web UI libraries that we have uh, for you web developers out there to help you with your implementation with developing a 10-foot user, uh, user interface for your TV apps. 
So there's two main UI libraries that we developed. And um, just to give a little brief history, we launched these at the very beginning of, of this year, around the end of January. We had a blog post go out on Google TV uh, in the beginning of February. And there was two different libraries that we produced. And, and the main reason and the main, I think the primary goal that we wanted to make uh, of these projects was to really make uh, keyboard navigation much, much simpler and easier for you guys to develop and to use. Um, keyboard navigation is essentially what enables the D-pad, right, in your, app, in your application. As, as, as Chris mentioned, with developing your, your web app for Google TV, this is a, an extremely critical piece to creating an optimal user experience um, with that optimal user interaction, right? You want your users to, to be able to navigate your site, your web app, using these arrow keys. And we found that this was not always incredibly easy to do, especially if your UI was a little bit more complex. So we had two different libraries that, you, that were sort of derived of two different common uh, libraries that you guys might be already familiar with. One is jQuery, and the other is the Clojure library. I want to talk about some of the high-level summaries that uh, sort of the subtle differences that exist between the two libraries to help you decide which one of the two are, is a better fit for you as a developer. If you're already a customer, if you're, if you're already a developer of the jQuery library, I think that's, that's a pretty simple choice then there for you. The jQuery library is probably what makes most sense if that's what you're already using within your existing applications. Um, Clojure library, if, if you're, same, same reasons there. If you're using Clojure library, that's, that's awesome. Um, and I would continue maybe checking out that library instead. But let's say you, you haven't used either and you sort of want to evaluate between the two. Here I have, I'm going to talk about a little bit some of the differences. And jQuery library requires a little bit more JavaScript. So it's a little bit more heavier on the JavaScript side. So it's going to do a lot more, or you're going to be uh, sort of configuring your library using JavaScript a little bit more. Whereas a closure library, you're sort of doing more with it your, within your HTML markup. So you're essentially decorating uh, common HTML elements like, like div containers or unordered list containers or uh, span elements and so forth, and just decorating them with, with special class names uh, that the library will then parse through and essentially you know, do, apply some logic to that and, and include that within your keyboard navigation. The jQuery library, instead, you'll be using things like CSS selector strings, which if you're already using jQuery, you, you might be familiar with. And one additional thing that it, it provides is we, we offer, which is currently in beta, by the way, uh, is a set of common UI controls, things like horizontal carousels, like, like slider controls, or the embedding of, of photos, doing like a slideshow, or embedding videos. It includes some, some library, additional libraries like that, which are part of the jQuery UI library, and it integrates keyboard navigation within that. So, so those are some additional UI controls that the jQuery UI library offers, which the Clojure library doesn't. On the other hand, the Clojure UI library, however, offers you, um, you know, really, really raw building blocks to build a really customized and really complex user interface. So it, it contains, you know, your building blocks as with like horizontal and vertical containers with scrollable components within, but it also contains extensions of those components, such as buttons. Um, you can sort of create links you know, where it, it immediately can navigate to a different URL if, if, if the enter key gets pressed and it can listen for that. Um, it has menu controls as well. So these are, and, and I'll show you some examples of this later on. But those are some of the subtle differences, I'd say, between the two. So the closure li library is a little bit more sort of starting from the ground up where the jQuery uh, I think provides you with a little bit, it tries to do a little bit more for you. <clears throat> There's three main, three main steps uh, in getting started on using these, these libraries if you want to, if you want to use them. And, and really, they're, they're really highlighted here. And there's stuff that, if you're a web developer out there, this is stuff that you're, you're probably already familiar with. Um, but, but really, it's, it's these simple three steps where you're using HTML markup to define the structure of, of your UI. Uh, so you are going to specify, you know, w using HTML, you know, which component, you know, what are your components that are going to, that you want selectable with the cursor, you, you know, and then how do you, do you want them to be selectable horizontally using left and right keys versus up down? 
Second is, is CSS. You're going to be using CSS3 because you know you're developing your web app on Chrome. And, and that's a huge benefit, as Chris mentioned, because you're, you're only dealing with one browser here. You know what, what HTML5 capabilities are available. You know what WebKit transitions and, and transforms you can use. And so you're going to really be using CSS a lot to present and help you sort of visualize, apply visualization to these, these, you know, these, these HTML components that you're adding within your web app. And then lastly, you're using JavaScript to really initialize, it's really used to initialize the library, initialize the, the keyboard navigation to be active, to essentially parse through your HTML DOM, for example, and look for those special class names or select all the, you know, all of the, the nodes that match the CSS selected strings and then to, and then to make them keyboard navigable. <clears throat> So here's, here's a, the, the next you know, few set of slides I want to I go over a little bit more in depth, right? Like the different steps in, in terms of using each library. So I want to start with jQuery. And this is a little bit of a you know, visual diagram of, of what maybe, what the zone, you know, what, what, how you would sort of lay out your structure, let's say you wanted to use this library, right? So there's a concept of, of keyboard behavior zones. And these zones are, are essentially nothing more than HTML containers. So, I typically use these with div elements or a UL, an ordered list element. And then you know, within each zone, you can contain a list, a variety of different HTML components, which can, which again are just HTML elements that you're already familiar with. They can be image tags, they can be paragraph tags, they can be whatever you want. And you're essentially gonna identify, you're gonna create some way to identify uh, those components within each zone. And each zone is, is essentially, um, you know, can be scrolled, it can be selected, you know, uh, left or right, depending on whether or not you want them to be selected horizontally or vertically. Um, and so in your jQuery library, you're essentially, in your HTML structure, going to be setting up, you know, different, different zones with different selectable components within. One added benefit uh, that the jQuery library takes care for you is that when you're, when you're navigating up and down between zones, it's automatically going to remember the last selected item within each zone. So that's something that's convenient that the library takes care of for you. Uh, the last optional feature, which I wanted to just mention, is really great for uh, quick prototyping. So let's say you have already an existing website or a web app that you want to see what it, you know, you want to quickly enable keyboard navigation uh, on your web app. The jQuery UI library provides something called the geometry feature. So you can toggle this flag called use geometry and set it to true. And when it does that, it'll sort of, you know, based on, you know, a Euclidean, dis it uses a Euclidean distance algorithm and it tries to calculate what's the next closest item to the right top, bottom, or, or left of this item that I'm currently at. And so when the user hits right, it'll try its best to select the next most intuitive element that it should go to. Like I said, this is great for prototyping. I, don't I wouldn't recommend leaving it turned on if you're going to full production because there's you know, visual, p p potentially maybe some visual uh, differences, maybe that you're just like sort of less in control over exactly where the focus is going to move to next. So uh, it's great for prototyping, um, but not for meant for full production. <clears throat> Here's an example of, uh, of the HTML structure that you, that, one example of what, what it might look like. Let's say you wanted to build some interface. Um, here's the concept. The, the, this is just HTML markup here. So you're essentially creating two zones. I'm, I'm essentially creating two zones here, zone one and zone two. Within the zone, I'm defining a set of rows. I can have one to as many item rows as, 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 as I want. And I'm setting a, a special class name uh, called item row, which I'm going to be using CSS selected strings to tell the jQuery URL library, here are my rows, and my rows are navigable horizontally from left to right. Within each row, I'm embedding individual components that I'm also ident identifying using semantic class names, so I'm, I'm calling it a class item, and I'm saying for those items, I want those to be focusable, right? So, so you can imagine w w with this sort of uh, structure, you can really Depending, you know, how the sizing you would control using CSS, you know, with your width and, and height rules and so forth. Um, but you can really do a lot of nesting uh, to create a variety of different rows and then different component, selectable components within. 
I wanted to just again mention you know, that CSS is incredibly important in terms of laying out your, your HTML and, and presenting them to the user uh, to help visualize how you want your items to be navigable. So for example, if you can read some of the CSS rules here, you don't have to look through all of them, but you know, I'm, I'm applying everything from some, some margins to you know, some dimensions width and height and also border radiuses and so forth. <clears throat> Last, the last step, which I mentioned, you know, there was three steps in JavaScript is, is, is what you're going to be using to initialize keyboard navigation uh, for uh, your HTML markup, which has already been set up in the way that I just showed you. And so this is an example. This is just a code snippet of how you would essentially create new instances of a key behavior zone object. Within the key behavior zone object contains a variety of different object uh, parameters that you're going to use to configure uh, and tell the library how to identify which components are selectable, which components are rows, and so forth. Some things I want to highlight here is the CSS selector strings, right? So I'm telling the, li the library for every, 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 uh, every HTML element that has a class name item, I want that to be selectable. Um, I'm going to tell it, you know, every, every, every class name that has a uh, specified item hyphen row, that's going to be represented as a row. <clears throat> The selection classes property is, is what you're going to be using to tell the library you know, when, when my user is actually focused on a specific element, it's going to ap apply, essentially append this specific class name to that element. So in my CSS, I can then give it some special styling to make it very apparent to the user where my current focus is. And lastly, the last example uh, is key mapping. There's a key mapping property where you can specify a variety of different key codes. So th these key codes are available on the web, right? And, and 13 is the key code that registers that fires when the user hits the enter key. And I'm telling jQuery library here to call my enter callback function, which I have defined somewhere else, to handle that, that event when it gets fired. <clears throat> and at the bottom there, the, the bottom box essentially just shows how, you, how it essentially ties everything together. So we have a, a top level like G key controller object, which you're creating a new instance of. And then you're creating, you're adding the two behavior zones that I created to it. And then you're calling a start method with the very first zone that you want to start the selection on. <clears throat> so that's, that's essentially a very, very quick uh, and dumbed down sort of code snippet on how easy it is to enable keyboard navigation uh, on your web app. I want to go through the same set of steps now, um, with, the, with the exception of now we're talking about closure library, because just to show you a little bit subtle differences between the two, and this is sort of the conceptual model of how the closure URL library works instead. So we have the concept of horizontal and vertical building blocks. So th these are, again, nothing, nothing but HTML containers. And, and one of the key differences um, between the jQuery and the closure is that the jQuery library, like I said, you, you're, you're specifying in your, ob, in your constructor you know, which, which objects, which HTML elements I want to include at, using CSS selected strings. But in the closure UI library, you're essentially doing this directly within your markup. So in your, in your HTML markup, you're, you're, you're specifying class names, these special class names that all start out with a TV hyphen prefix. So things like TV container horizontal will indicate to the library that I want this container to be uh, scrollable, uh, to be navigable left and using left and right keys. It also contains, we also have special class names to identify which containers can be scrollable. And so it, within your CSS, if you uh, specify like a smaller viewport window, so a, a small width and a small height that only shows, let's say, three components inside, you can specify that to be a scrolling container very easily similarly by applying a class name. And then I, I briefly talked about how there's different extensions of uh, TV components, which are, are all going to be selectable uh, with your keyboard na navigation. And this, this could include things like buttons and, and links and also input, for example. So what does the HTML markup look like for this library instead? So this is a very similar example. Uh, I have uh, essentially two snippets of uh, a, a UL element with class name, the special class names, TV container uh, horizontal and TV container vertical. 
And that's essentially saying to the library, I want, I want this container to be navigable using left-right keys, and then the other one to be navigable using up and down arrow keys. Within my, my horizontal vertical containers, I have three different components, which I'm specifying as a TV component, and that's telling the library that I want this to be selectable. Uh, if, if I had additional elements in there that were not labeled with that class, then the library wouldn't recognize it and include it uh, in that container as they're navigating with their keyboard. And then lastly, on the right, I show you again some examples of the CSS styling rules that is really critical to helping to visualize uh, or represent these, these HTML, this, this markup uh, and, and make it look sort of the way you want it to navigate. So for example, for, for all list elements within my horizontal container, I want to apply a display, an, an, an inline block display rule, which is going to stack them, you know, uh, instead of stacking them one below each other, I'm going to put them next to each other instead. On this slide, I wanted to also show that as an example, uh, TV container, uh, like horizontal and vertical containers, are not, uh, do not have to be standalone on themselves. You can actually use them uh, to nest within each other. Um, and this is actually part of how uh, you would actually build a complex UI with this. Because you can imagine you have a variety of different, maybe you have one top level uh, vertical container that you want to be able to create essentially different zones, almost similar to what, what I showed you with jQuery and create a variety of different rows um, that you're creating using the horizontal containers. <clears throat> the next point I wanted to talk about is I mentioned scrolling containers. So if I have uh, a, a list of, a long list of elements, a TV components within a scrolling container, such as like that's going vertically in this example, and let's say I use CSS to minimize the viewport of my vertical container to only show three components at a time. I can essentially just wrap all my child components around a special uh, class name called TV Container Start Scroll. And as I'm scrolling down, the, the library will magically enable this so that if, as the user hits down on, on, the, on the arrow keys, it's going to always maintain, it's going to, it's, it's, it's going to scroll the, uh, the vertical container. It's going to translate it using WebKit transforms uh, to move down to, to, to show the next you know, the next component that, that's, that's below it. And so it, it just kind of works magically. Uh, and it really, it really is up to you to use uh, CSS rules to, to enable the interaction uh, to appear this way. <clears throat> and lastly, JavaScript is, is, this is the last piece of JavaScript that uh, you're really going to be using to enable this, this library to uh, sort of initialize and scan through your HTML DOM and look for these special class names and then include it within your keyboard navigation scheme. <clears throat> so essentially what I'm showing here, there's, there's a single method that you're going to be calling called tv.ui.decorate. And within that, you're passing in uh, the root parent HTML node, where it's then going to scan through all of its child elements and look for these, these especially uh, decorated uh, class names. And then at the bottom there, you're essentially just calling try focus on the first element that you want to start out uh, your focus on. So I wanted to just show really quick uh, a few demos uh, of essentially very similar interfaces, but I wanted to show some building blocks that are using both uh, the Clojure library and the jQuery. Uh, I think visually, they're, they're not going to necessarily appear very different, but they're both, uh, it, just, it just goes to show that you can really accomplish the same, uh, this very, very similar interfaces with both libraries, but it's really a matter of taste and depending on what, you, what, what it is you want to do. <clears throat> Am I uh, connected? I could have had this. Hmm. Let me try this again. Uh, are you on Wi Fi? Let me try this. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> That's a good request. Uh, I'll have karaoke for you afterwards in the sandbox area. <laughs> I'll take requests, too. <clears throat> OK. Um, so unfortunately, we're having some Wi-Fi or, or wired internet connection issues. Um, if you go to that, that Go link, um, you can actually check out some of the demos yourself. And all of, uh, you can navigate the entire demo site using, uh, using keyboard. And that's the whole point, right? And, and so it's actually a really good, good exercise for you to check out those demos, look at the various examples within, and then look at the, view the source, and you'll see how simple uh, the HTML markup actually looks. Um, and then you'll see the JavaScript libraries, uh, the calling functions, which I showed you here. So, uh, so thank you, and then I'll, I guess I'll bring it. I'll, I'll get it over back to Chris. Thanks, Dan. So, thanks. So, really, what we're asking people to do is to think about how the applications are already building might work in the TV space in the living room. Think about what new applications actually you could build because you're in that space, and. Also, I personally believe there are a lot of lessons we can learn about how to build better experiences that work on desktop and mobile and are more effective in those spaces as well once you look at how that works when you're kind of kicking back. And finally, you know, get a Google TV device, start building applications. Um, if you have applications you want to build and you need a device, get a hold of us. We can, I'm sure we can work something out. We have a code site. We have a forum um, that we participate in quite a bit. And with that, we're actually... Um, just about out of time, so uh, uh, I do want to ask that anyone who, who can uh, please provide feedback on the session. That helps us get better. And um, our hashtags are up there. So if you have questions, come on up, um, ask them to us, but I think we're going to have to hand over the, the stage to the next, next set. <laughs>